Maybe thousands of people are gathering in the aftermath of last night's collision between the naked runners and the uh, the protesters in that silly story I covered. I'm joined by Chuck Todd, moderator of Meet the Press. Chuck, I don't know if you'll be covering the primal scream at Harvard. I don't think you can actually show the footage of that event on NBC. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I think I'm going to have enough fireworks and enough primal screams uh, from folks. Uh, when I interviewed Dick Cheney. Uh, uh, oh, uh, so that's who it is? It's Vice President Cheney's your guest? Vice, Pre- Vice President Cheney. Uh, and I also have Ron Wyden, who will uh, represent sort of the Democrats uh, when it comes to the to the report that the Intelligence Committee put out. But, yeah, no, uh, I'm going to have a... Uh, I think a pretty, hopefully a pretty robust conversation with the former vice president. Well, I began the show today with uh, Mike Pompeo was out at Langley today talking about this, and he blasted Dianne Feinstein. I'm curious, Chuck Todd, if you think the motivation of Senator Feinstein has been sufficiently explored as a political issue and a, a journalistic issue here, she's being, I mean, the timing of this is awfully suspicious. Well, I think it's, you know, I think there's, I think there's complicated tension between different parts of the government here. Um, John Brennan upset at Dine Feinstein. John Brennan upset at the White House. Doesn't feel like the White House has done enough there. White House not happy with Dine Feinstein. John Brennan not happy with Leon Panetta and how Leon Panetta uh, uh, basically allowed the access that he allowed. So this is this is a more complicated political story than I think, you know, it's, it doesn't just break in the normal red versus blue, or this is just a, this is, this is, I think it got personal, frankly, between Brennan and Feinstein in a way that I don't think we've ever seen a relationship between an intelligence committee chair and a CIA director get before. Well, I agree with that. And I think it's because Brennan, who has, of course, been a loyal Obama soldier as counterterrorism chief at the White House and now at the agency, I think she he thinks she was grandstanding and that there's no other explanation for this. You know, it, it does put a lot of people in peril of prosecution before the International Criminal Court if they are. Uh, we're not a signatory to that treaty, but our allies are in some instances. You get an aggressive right. prosecutor such as the Spanish guy who went after Pinochet a few years ago and our friends are going to end up dragged before the ICC. Well, I mean, this was, look, I know for a fact these were some of the arguments that, that uh, Brennan was making about uh, having this public in the first place. Uh, I think that there were, frankly, some in the some in the White House, I don't know if everybody, but some in the White House that were kind of hoping the clock would run out, uh, uh, meaning that the end of the year comes, Senate Republicans take over. Uh, uh, this was, put it this way, this was one issue that the White House, I think, not everybody at the White House, but some at the White House and definitely everybody at the CIA would have been happy had uh, with the Republicans in power uh, when it comes to this report. Uh, and I think they were hoping the clock would run out and the report wouldn't see a lot of that. Now, Chuck, you, you've you been around D.C. for a long time, so you know that as legislators get old and their stars begin to set, uh, they get more and more anxious for headlines to be about them. Is there some aspect of this that Diane Feinstein at 81 just wants one last turn in center I, stage? I, you know, I don't know that, you know, because here's the thing. Up until these la- this last year of contentiousness between Feinstein and, and Brennan, she was never, you know, it was more of the Mark Udalls and the, and the Ron Wydens that were the ones that were uh, very, very skeptical of 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 some of the things that in the intelligence community does. She was always somebody that was seen as a bipartisan member, you know, sort of a, a longstanding bipartisan member of the national security apparatus. You know, there's sort of this unofficial part of Washington where uh, a Stephen Hadley and a Tom Donlin, right, the, the national security advisors uh, to Bush and Obama, uh, regularly get together. Yep. You know, uh, it, that sort of thing. There is sort of this above politics apparatus, and she was always considered a member of that sort of unofficial tribe, if you want to call it that, if, if we if we tried to uh, uh, create a family tree of tribes here. Um, but again, I go back to, I, look, I don't know about the motivation of sort of, you know, the end of the career stuff, but I do think there certainly is, when you look at the legacy of the of, of Congress, and the fact that, that Congress, you know, there's a lot of Democrats who think they abdicated their responsibility uh, and frankly, some Republicans who feel like they didn't provide the oversight they should have provided in the in the moment. 
And well, so, so, so much sort of, of this vitriol, you're, you're getting into something here that a lot of people don't understand. So much of the vitriol, like the there's a guy over at State who says the worst things about Cheney, not realizing he's Dick Armitage's buddy, and Dick Armitage is still embarrassed for getting Scooter Libby sent to jail, I mean, indicted, because there's Dick Armitage who's responsible for that. So much of this is personal, but no one ever understands it outside of the Beltway. It's funny you say that. I always say that some of this stuff, the, 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 the nastiest views in politics never have to do with the D and the R. It's always personal. Uh, there's always a personal element to this. Uh, and I think, in particular, there definitely is a personal element to this between Brennan and Pakistan, to be perfectly honest. Well, now, if you have time, I hope you ask the vice president what I asked Pompeo. I think Congress ought to uh, pass some kind of law uh, that will pick up the defense costs of anyone thrown in front of the ICC because of this. Because we do have allies who helped us in Poland and other places. And they are, I believe, signatories of the ICC. And they can end up, and, and they ought, it's impoverishing if you get thrown into that process. And Congress used to pick up the costs of people who were prosecuted by special counsels and independent uh, 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 prosecutors. I, I would think we would do the same for our allies. Chuck, I wanted to ask you as well, uh, this is an Inside the Beltway story, but the, the new republic has collapsed. And uh, you've been following politics for so long at the National Journal and at Emmy. I'm sure you know at least half of the people who have quit the new republic in the last week, right? Yeah. Uh, I have to say, I've been watching this with sort of, I feel like um, I feel like a lot of people. Uh, you know, look, there, there, there's clearly not a lot of love lost for the owner, uh, and and it and it does. You know, he, he he came in with some, he came in with a big splash, but um, this this sort of lamenting of what the new republic had, yeah, the new republic hadn't been what the new republic was in a while. I think the new republic had an identity crisis for quite some time. Uh, you know, I'd argue its heydays were sort of the 80s and 90s. Uh, and then it struggled to reinvent itself in the digital era. You know, some of the owners, some of Chris Hughes' criticism about the digital aspect was true. I mean, look at how National Review and The Nation, let's just take two other ideological magazines, left and right here. They both figured out a way to reinvent themselves in the digital era uh, with some success. The Nation, make, you know, doing having some success with creating personalities again on TV. But, uh, the National Review, I mean, in many ways, the corner was, at the time, when they created the corner, that was... That was a big deal, and it truly sort of reinvigorated National Review at a time when they felt under siege. So, you know, both, you know, there were ways to reinvent yourself in the digital era, and I think his, his chief criticism on that was a, was a fair criticism. How he's gone about it, of course, is where I think everybody's been upset. Well, this goes also to does he have a plan? Because the Weekly Standard has evolved very well in the digital age. Town Hall has evolved. The Washington mm-hmm. Examiner, Politico, they're all out there. NBC is trying to do the same thing. You've mentioned some of the other success stories. But Chris Hughes arrives in town, and you end up. What you want to do is get your talent to go online. You don't want your talent to go across the street. Well, that's right, and I think that this stuff has to be organic. Uh, and and so, well, look, I, I think, look, I think New Republic struggled. First of all, I think their biggest struggle is they didn't know what they were ideologically. Remember, they were the they were the third way magazine for a long time. But I mean, by third way, sort of, they were they were sort of the uh, the. Uh, the anti-union democratic magazine, you know what I mean? Sort of pushing the, the DLC. And I don't, I say they're anti-union. They weren't anti-union, but they were not a, they were not a, the progressive magazine. They were sort of the antithesis to the nation, more of the Bill Clinton wing, Al Gore wing of the party back in the day. And then I just think they, they, I think they had sort of a, uh, they were struggling to figure out who, where they fit on the political spectrum. Uh, and as the Democratic Party went more progressive and went left, I think they just they didn't know where to go. Well, now I think they're going to fit under the invisible category. Last question, Chuck Todd, as uh, Washington descends, do you expect to actually have the Senate still around by Sunday or will the Supreme I, Court be safe? <laughs> my gut is actually yes. Um, oh, no. Because, no, I don't, I don't think it means that anything's going to. I just think that look, there's enough progressive senators and conservative senators who don't like this, which, by the way, talk about, like, we now see the populist splits in both parties are there for everybody to see. I just think that they're going to, I just think Harry Reid and Mitch McConnell are going to see their lives a bit uh, a bit uncomfortable this weekend. I just don't think it's going to go smoothly. I assume they'll get it done. That's too bad, because I want them gone in, in the event that any vacancy occurs on the Supreme Court. I want Mitch McConnell to be the one to block any uh, presidential nominee there for the rest of time. 